Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special edition of HR Mentorship Book Review. As always, we have our ever reliable, dependable, consistent panelist, discussant, Ezine Obiora, and she is currently the Chief HR and Operations Officer at Femo Vision. Okay, and today, for the second time ever, at HR Mentorship Book Review, we'll be having a male, is male, and he chooses to identify as a male. <laughs> Who are? When Azine says something, pay attention. She requests <laughs> it and she's getting it. And our co-discussant today, co-reviewer today, is Omogbemi Oluwa Shegun. He's an HR associate and is also an HR consultant with Mark Cauter's Consulting Limited. Without much ado, I would like to hand over to our delectable host, Ezine. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Yemi. Uh, good evening, everyone. I can see someone saying that they can't hear anything, Ibukun Olua. Can everybody else hear me? Let's know whether it's Ibukun. Oh, it's clear. It's the Salah Ram that is disturbing. <laughs> OK. Ibukun, you need to. Maybe you need to drink some water to flush out the ram so that you can hear. But okay, thank you. Okay, so everyone, welcome to our session, our book review uh, session for today. I know it feels like it's been a while, it's been a bit, but yeah, good to be back. And um, welcome to Shegu. Thank you, Shegu, for accepting to co-review with me. So it will be Shegu and I that are going to go through this very interesting book that was brought to us by... Let me make an honorable worthy mention, Vicky, you know, an, an amazing book, 200 Employee Engagement Ideas for HR and Managers. And I think that this book, um, it resonates a lot with us. I mean, it brought up a lot of conversation, you know, in the, in, in, in the chat room, how, albeit, a, you know, a, a last minute conversation, right? But, but you know, people were talking about it because it's very relatable. I mean, all the other books we've talked about are relatable, but then this just, um, it resonates a lot with, you know, a lot of us. So we're going to take it in, you know, as we usually do, we take it in portions. I will do the introduction and then uh, Shagun will come in at the middle to talk on his own, you know, give his own highlights on, you know, his review of the book. And then I'll come in with my own comments, you know, and then round up the session. We hope that somebody is still saying volume. I don't know why. Don't, don't worry, Zine. I will okay. handle, just focus only on the book. I will handle non-book issues. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Yemi. Okay, so yeah, so uh, we hope that at some point, you know, we can we can make it as concise as possible so that people, there'll be time for people to make their comments or ask questions. Let's see how it goes, but I'll start, you know, I'll take it from there, take it from here. Okay, so uh, we know that, see, if, if there is a high level of employee engagement, it impacts the organization. Whether, they, whether, it's, whether there's a high level, whether there's a low level, they all impact the organization in different ways. And we've talked about it even in the group. If there's a high level of, of engagement, it impacts the comp, uh, organization positively. And if there's a low level, of course, we know what's, what that does to the organization. Now, according to studies, you see that highly uh, engaged organizations tend to have higher levels of profitability, lower levels of absenteeism, because if you're, if you're engaged, you, you're happy to be at work. You know, you're, you're at work, you're present, because you know you can be present, but then you're not present. But then you see that people are, you know, present. They are ha they, they they are happy to be at work. You have lower levels of sick leave. I found that too. That people are, you know, you don't find more uh, many instances of sick leave because people are pumped up to come to work. Um, for some companies, they get higher uh, stock price growth, and of course, the major thing at the end of the day, which is what the companies are looking out for, the bottom line, there is increased profitability there's higher revenue you know when there's engagement yeah so we're going to go because the book took you know went into different areas you know it's it's it broke things down into different areas so I'm going to talk through certain areas and the first part we're talking about is uh implementing an engagement survey so we're going to, I'm going to talk through implementing an engagement survey 
during the engagement survey after it and then an engaging performance strategy. So I'm really it's highlights, you know, I'm going to go into highlights. Um, so first of all, to, to establish or to begin that engagement journey, it's for most companies, it's best that you implement a comprehensive engagement survey, right? And we've talked about it and we emphasize to do this, because I think somebody had asked this question in the group, to make this successful, it's best that you use an external, a third party, a third party consultant, you know, it, it removes bias, you know, um, and it also, it also gives comfort to people because I found people say, you know, they're, they're, they're wary about answering questions because they're not sure of the confidentiality, excuse me, or the unknown, or, or the fact or or with being anonymous, you know, they don't want, oh, people are afraid that, oh, they can't bear their minds. If they bear their minds, you know, the company is going to know, the decision is going to know they're the ones, but they, are, they have a little bit of comfort in knowing that, okay, it's not the company handling, it's a third party. And I know this firsthand. I've worked in companies where if they know that it's HR in the company that is organizing a survey, they are very reluctant to answer questions. They're like, mm -hmm, because they don't want to have their thoughts out there. So yes, use a third party consultant, you know, that removes the bias. And then of course you have to get buy-in from the management because I mean, if you're putting out something and you don't have buy-in from the management, you've already failed. So you must sell it to them, put it to them and make them see reason why, you know, it's a worthy cost, why it's something that should be taken off. And then train and onboard your people. So it's not just to bring a survey and administer and then that. It. I remember I worked somewhere and what we did was we took people through um, the survey. So it wasn't, we didn't just, you know, send out the survey. We had um, training sessions where we had people understand, make them understand what the survey was about, what it was looking to achieve. And we also ran through how we're going to go through the survey. So it was, okay, when the results come out, we had to train each HOD how to unpack the results of the survey. Yeah. So we had each HOD sit with their team uh, members and unpack the re results. So HR would sit with them and make sure it was done right because we also wanted transparency, right? And then there were discussions around it, yeah? So as they unpacked, it wasn't, it wasn't a checkbox thing. It was unpacked, you know, people were made to see the results of the survey, uh, you know, the things that were major issues, you know, highlights and all that. And they were talked through, everybody discussed it, you know? to know, okay, oh, this is what is this? This is how people answered this. This is where people are tending towards. And then, yeah, so it was a discussion. Everybody was involved and everybody was trained on how to receive the results of the survey. Like we said, well, we'll get to that. It's not just about doing a survey. It's about implementing actions from the trends that you have noticed, yeah? But we'll get to that. So when you're doing the survey, you have to establish the reason for that survey. Make sure that, you're actually measuring engagement. So you work with your consultants to make you make sure that you're administering the right instrument. So you could, because you could be administering an instrument and it's not achieving what you wanted to achieve. So you have to ensure that, you know, that instrument is measuring, is actually measuring engagement. And then I remember there was a talk in, in the group about, you know, what the frequency of a survey should be. Um, to be honest, you don't want to give your people fatigue because if you keep on coming with surveys, 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 they're like, ah, HR, you know, you're always with this service. So you want to make it as, um, as impactful as possible. So you can have, you, you would decide, but you don't want to administer too many surveys. You can have one survey, maybe annually, it's up to you, but then it has to have results. Yeah. And then in between, you can now do poll surveys, you know, get polls from the people, get feedback, on a regular basis to determine or figure out what's going on in the system, what the current trend is, what the patterns are, yeah? But like I said, a survey is recommended annually. If you decide according to your company, you want to do it in a different frequency, that's up to you, but you don't want to have survey fatigue. Um, and the reason why it is recommended that it's annually is because, you know, things change, you know, data could become uh, outdated, you know, obsolete. And then things might have happened along the way. People have changed, you know, have new people in. Things could change. So you want to be able to have refreshed data all the time, which is why it's recommended that, you know, um, you do it annually. And then again, if you're actually, um, if you're actually uh, uh, actioning things, right, the next time you do a survey, 
that thing that was a pain point before in maybe in 2021, in 2022 might not be a pain point. It might be something else that would be a pain point. So that's why you need to uh, administer that survey regularly. And then I emphasize, let your feedback be for actioning. So it's not enough to sit in the um, company with your teams and then unpack your results. And then that's it after you say, oh, goodbye until next year. No, you have to put out concrete steps on how to, what you're planning to do to action these items. I'll give you an example. So this same place that I worked in, when we would do the unpacking, right? Um, we would then highlight, pinpoint the major issues and then we'd bring them out. So I, I was like the um, owner of this, I was the, I was the task owner. But of course, I was working. I was not the task owner per se. I was I was co-owner with, you know, um, my manager. So we're working hand in hand. And what we did was we identified some issues, and then we decided to focus on certain issues. Remember, I think from my um, the review I posted said you can't tackle everything all at once. It's not possible. You could identify so many issues. If you're going to say you're going to tackle everything at once, you're 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 wasting your time. So figure out the ones that you want to focus on. So for us, sometimes we'll say, okay, we want to focus on um, performance. We want to focus on you know, particular things. And then that's what we're going to do. So what we would do would, would extract one or two things. And we say, this is our focus for the year. And we're going to map out exact steps to handle this particular issue. And it's not just that we had to make ourselves accountable. So what we did was we would do quarterly reviews. So we've identified this issue at the beginning when we have unpacked the results of the survey. Every quarter would sit down with our team members and say, you know, ask what is our measure? What do you think our, our, our level of progress is? You know, we're getting feedback from them. We're measuring it from other, you know, other things. And then we put all that together. So we check, okay, are we there yet? Um, do we, is there more work to be done? Have we actually even started? Have we scratched the surface? And then we do this until we get to a point where we, we have reached, you know, sometimes we may not have to reach 100%, but we've gotten to like 80 or 90% and we're like, mm, maybe we should close this out. We think we've reached a, an agreeable uh, level of progress. And then we move on to the next thing. So you can't tackle everything at once. You have to, you know, bring out the issue. You have to bring out focus areas and then track your performance, you know, along the way, make yourself accountable to your people. Because if you keep collecting feedback without action, you just create cynicism. When you come back next year or you come back in a couple of months time and tell your people, oh, um, I want to do a survey. They're like, I'm like, this is not the survey that you, you did before. What, what did we see from it? You will just come with your survey. So you want to build that trust in your people. Let them see that there's action. And I can tell you that you know, firsthand because, because of what we did, because we made ourselves accountable, the next time we would come with survey, the people that were willing to listen, they were like, oh yeah, because we can see results. We can see that this thing is achieving results. So we're happy to, you know, take another survey. So that's, I mean, that's what builds the trust in your people. Now, connect your strategy to, your engagement strategy to key business metrics. What do you want to see? What, what are the, how do you, how do you want to see, you know, um, how much impact engagement is making? You would have to now identify those metrics and then it is there you know from analytics by the time you've measured you now see how the strategy has impacted the business and that will help you in the future get uh, uh, management future management by remember I think I answered the question someone was talking about you know when people want to do things like retreats and you you know the company is like it's too expensive and I talked about baby steps so if you do things on a smaller version on a smaller level and then you're able to um tie that to something and say oh based on this people were impacted people people are more engaged maybe you can say oh the level of absenteeism you know has dropped drastically you're able to tie that to a metric and then you can go back to you know organization and say oh there's a higher level of productivity maybe based on your performance um, appraisal and all that you're able to say see this was what's the this was the impact that this was able to make and then, yeah, by the time you're showing management numbers, you're not telling them stories, they can see the data. Then they will now say, hmm, this is something that we should maybe look into because we can see tangible impact, right? Um, then make sure that you get everybody involved in the survey. And I, how do you get them involved? 
you know, you, like I said, there's a, tr you train everyone, you know, you make sure that everyone is onboarded on how to, you know, read results, interpret results and all that. Yeah. So you, you, by the time everybody's fully participants, by the time everybody's fully involved, by the time, um, you and by the time you have everyone be part of the survey, because if you have partial participation, it does it may not help your your results, right? So you want to make sure that you sell it to people to make them trust enough to say, okay, fine, we're going to do the survey, which is which speaks to the first part I talked about about um, using a third party consultant. Yeah, that way you're able to prove to them or show to them that there will be some level of anonymity and there will be confidentiality. So rest assured, your information is safe. Nobody's going to tie anything to you, yeah? Um, and of course, like I said, we talked about confidentiality. I did talk about focus areas. You can't take everything all at once. Now, when you have, when your results come in, don't waste time, roll out your results, unpack them, speak with your people, you know? It's not, this is not a management uh, responsibility. Everybody has to be, you know, uh, involved. I remember when I was, you know, in doing those kind of things, you know, I would tell my boss, it's not, it's not just HR. This is not HR uh, work. This is a, it's a partnership. So we're going to work with me. We're going to, you know, to make sure that whatever we have identified, you know, um, we're able to action it. And of course, to the people we say, it's all of us are working together to make sure that these actions that we implement, yeah, that they work. So it's, it's not, it's not, we're not looking to one person. We're not looking to leadership to implement these things. It's a joint uh, participation is a joint partnership then take advantage of employee focus groups you have groups where and well like this one the example i gave you know it was it was not focus groups per se but we had unpacking for teams so we would all sit down you know in different teams with different departments and everybody's talking around the results of the of the survey and now identifying or seeing the identified trends or identified issues so everybody was involved or everybody's involved in in the unpacking of every you know the um the survey uh yeah and then let your feedback be transparent yeah sometimes the the feedback from from the surveys may not be palatable it may not be palatable to the manager manager is seeing that you know people are saying uh, my manager is a terrible manager whatever or you know you might have very unpalatable um feedback but take it in stride you know you have to still give that information it may even be HR, you know, maybe the sentiments about HR are really bad based on the survey. Yeah, you have to still make it transparent so that people will trust you. They will know that, okay, you're, there's no coloring of these results. You're saying it as it is and you're willing to make things work. You're willing to make things better. Then ask for feedback. So when you have that survey or when you roll out your survey, you also want to get a, uh, the pulse of the people to know what they think about the survey. You know, what do they think, you know? Do they think, you know, what are their thoughts? Do they think it could be better? Are there any ways of improvement? You have to, this is all part of involving the people. Then you identify owners, task owners. Like I said, it's not just management. It's not just HR. Some people might be key stakeholders in this, identify them and make them accountable to make these actions implemented. And then sometimes if you want to effect change, you've identified these issues, right? And you want to effect change based on what you have gotten from your survey, you can start from, you know, the teams and start to effect that change. You know, they, you know, they say little drops of water make a mighty ocean. By the time you start with the little department, you start with the teams and the departments, before you know it, it becomes a company-wide, um, it becomes a company-wide impact because, you know, it, it just, you know, it just blossoms out, you know, outward. So yeah, start to try, try to effect your change from the smaller, from the base, before you now go upwards. When they see that, you know, things are happening right on the smaller scale, then it will become, it will become um, evident all around the organization. Um, make sure that you communicate progress. I said something when I gave an example. So for every step of the way we were doing, you know, we had unpacked the results of this survey. We made sure to have quarterly reviews. We would tell them, this is where we are at. You know, we would have, I mean, we're tackled. You know, team members will say, oh, but we don't think we're seeing any change. What have you done? Okay, you say you've done this, but, you know, so we were open to that feedback, right? And we would take learnings from there and go from there and say, okay, maybe, excuse me, maybe 
what we are doing is not really that effective. Maybe we need to do it this way. So you have to communicate and keep everybody updated along the way with your progress so that they know that, you know, it's not just something you're just, you're, 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 actually, so you're actually making yourself accountable all the way to the people. Now, um, somebody asked a question about, I remember someone talked about strategy, asked about what strategy was and tactics. And I remember the question was answered. The strategy is the plan, right? And the tactics are the, the measures, the activities, the things you do to um, implement or give life to that plan, right? Now, well, the book suggests that you can use a platform that caters to employee engagement, right? Um, separate from your HRIS, you know, you shouldn't be together. However, it should speak to your HRIS, so it should be integrated. If that's something you can do, fine. And then when you do that, make sure that there's communication around onboarding. You don't want to just bring in this platform and then people are like wondering what this is about. You have to communicate, communicate. If you notice a lot of this book says communicate, you have to communicate to your people. And of course, the tool has to be tweaked to suit the organizational needs. No one size fits it all. And by the time we get into the engagement uh, suggestions proper, you will see that what works for one company will not work for another. You, what works for Ford may not work for Immobile. So you have to remember that if there's a suggestion about a, an, a, a, um, an engagement uh, activity, it, it, you don't have to take it. I mean, I remember that when I did my review, I took the ones that resonated with me. There were certain ones I was like, mm, I don't know. But yeah, so you, you do what works for you and work, what works for your organization. Now, um, one, other, one other way to, um, um, to have your people engage or one big way to have your people engage is recognition. People, people are so um, motivated by recognition. You don't even understand how much. And it's not just even money. Money is one side, but then those little acts you know, of recognition, they go a long, long, long way. It impacts people's workplace performance. Things as little as a handwritten letter. Somebody may say, mm, that one will not work for me. But for some people, that's it. That's it. It gingers them you know, to give their best. So recognition is so important. And don't limit recognition to just supervisor to employee. You have pair to pair. I remember also where I worked somewhere, you know, we would have meetings. Every time we had meetings, there is a portion of our meeting that is kept aside for recognition. And you're recognizing your pair. It's not about recognizing your, um, your boss or your boss recognizing you. Yeah, he can do that or they can do that. But then there were things, oh, this person works, we work together as a team and um, we did something together and I appreciate. So, you know, we had that culture, you know, we had the culture of recognition. We had things like kudos boards where we would, you know, put kudos for people, you know, just to make them feel. So they're not necessarily waiting for that recognition from the boss. There, were also, there was also the... Um, parallel or the side to side or pair to pair recognition. And then make your performance conversations. The book says, make your performance conversations regularly. So I find that certain organizations wait till the end. You know, when you're in the, the performance appraisal is in December, that's when the, your boss wants to say everything about you know that sometimes what that brings about, it brings about some rancor, it brings about people feeling terrible because they have surprises. They didn't know about all these things and all of a sudden they're hearing this and they're like, okay, where is this from? But if you're having regular check-in meetings, monthly meetings, I recommend monthly meetings. They work like magic. You know, you have those check-ins with your boss and say, we want, please, can we talk about my performance? You know, you know that way you have room to um, track, your, track where you are, what you need to do. So that it's not when you're almost at the finish line that you now start scoring to to meet up with your performance score. So, so those, those kind of conversations also keep people engaged because I know that my boss cares about me. He wants to, he, ha, he has brought out time or she has brought out time to talk with me about my performance, yeah? And that makes me also look forward to the performance appraisal. I'm not, I'm not waiting for that, you know, in fear, but I'm looking forward to it, yeah? So, I mean, that brings about, um, what you call it? It brings about engagement. And it's also, the book also talked about allowing people to come to work as their authentic selves now i don't know because there have been talks about people having a work persona and you have a home persona and all that i don't know i i have always worked in places where i am me and i'm free to be me and i know what that does for me so i i, I have quirks certain quirks about me and you know my boss or my bosses they know the quirks and they're fine with it what is yeah what matters to them is are you doing the work that you're here for? Are you giving the deliverables that you're here for? So 
create that environment for people to be their authentic selves because um, if they are, if they have that opportunity to express themselves freely, then there's a level of engagement. If I come to work, if I'm getting to work and I'm having palpitations because I'm supposed to fit a person, certain persona that I'm not so comfortable about, I don't know how engaged I would be. So yeah, that's really it for me for that first part of the book. I will hand over to Shego for his part and then I'll come in with comments of my own. Over to you, Shego. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hello, Z, can you confirm if you can hear me, please? I can hear you. We can hear you loud and clear. We can okay. hear you. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Olua Shego So we'll be talking about our book for the month, 200 employee engagement ideas for HR and managers. So, but before I start, I would like to put this straight to everybody. I've not seen any organization in this world that can stay yeah. out of competition. But I believe an organization can actually stay out of competition, stay ahead of competition. In making sure they are very, very intentional and critical about their daily activities, how to get to meet their targets and their stakeholder management, as well as the staff, the able hands they have working with them. That's actually what makes them stand out among their competitive brands out there. And that is their unique setting point. So also we need to know that as managers, as HR and managers, we manage two critical things that pertains to the work, to the company we are working with, and one of which is work, and the other one is people. So work in the sense that as an organization, we have our lay down rules and regulations, we have our objectives, we have our goals, our mission statement, our mission statement that okay, as a company, this is actually what we are looking at to be in the next five years. This is projects we're actually trying to execute. And this is how we get to go about achieving everything we put in place, carrying out feasibility studies and also the source analysis. But after all, all this being said and done, it's not something we can do all by ourselves as managers. We need people to work with us. We need competent and we need able hands that will work with us in this regard to just make sure everything is being brought into fruition. So that, that's actually where employee engagement comes in because you get to work with different kinds of people from all walks of life. So how do you get to deal with working with people with diverse opinions, diverse mindsets? How do you manage their, their differences? So that's actually where employee engagement actually comes to, to bear. So employee engagement actually talks about the level of commitment and involvement of employees that they have towards the work and the organization that they work for. So it's actually cuts across every phase of an organization, which is vital in achieving the laid down goals and objectives. Yeah. So employees, when they feel more engaged, have a sense of belonging. They are they feel they are part of the team, they are part of the company. So they they, they tend to give more, they tend to thrive more. And this actually transcends to their day-to-day -day activities in work and also their relationship with their colleagues. Because like if I am if I'm going to work and I'm happy to go to work, I feel I'm part of this team. Definitely, I will do everything possible to make sure I'm working in alignment with the lay down goals and objectives of the company. So that's actually where employee engagement is actually critical. So now, as managers and HR, we also need to learn how to delegate tasks to our staff. We have a project, we have tasks that we can give to people. We shouldn't just be okay, manager that wants to do everything about by ourselves. You should learn how to do some sort of division of labor, delegate tasks to your staff, and all you can do as manager is just to supervise and ensure everything is achieved. So delegate tasks to them. This actually give them a sense of responsibility and taking ownership. With that, they get to learn through what they are doing, and they know they have to do everything possible to ensure the result is being achieved. Also, you have to be accessible as manager and a teacher. You have to be accessible. So an open door policy is actually a welcoming idea. You shouldn't be a manager where you have a staff that they can't walk up to us anytime they feel like they're having an issue or something bothering them as far as the work is concerned. The staff, your staff should be able to walk up to you at any point in time just to share an idea or even bring, on, bring in their own quota in achievement of the goals of the company. So we, as managers, we should be able to carry our staff along in the decision-making process. 
So this actually makes them feel part of the team. So we can actually implement, implement something like weekly or monthly meeting where the management team and the entire staff get to talk about their delivery boost for the for the week or for the month and we talk about how we get to work together in achieving more results or how we get to work together in making sure our stakeholders they are well treated as far as the work is concerned. So as, as far as the book is concerned, I also got to learn that as managers, we shouldn't just make it like everybody has to be about the work. We all know our staff, the main reason why we are work is to do the job, get the job done and achieve our set targets. But as managers, we also have a critical role to play in, in the personal and professional development of our staff. We have to be very intentional about their future. We have to invest in their future. We shouldn't just make it like you just have to work, work, work. Let them feel value, let them feel part of the team. So we should be concerned about that personal development. So the way I feel we can agree about this is actually probably uh, encouraging them to pick some skills online, like job and soft skills, where they get to learn about interpersonal skills, where they have to learn how to manage their stakeholders, both internal and external stakeholders. They have to learn how to relate with their team members. They also get to learn about communication skills because I believe ninety percent of what we do on our job is actually about communication. Is that is that oral communication or written communication? Because we send mails, we talk to our colleagues, we talk to our stakeholders, or even our subordinates. So how do you get to do that effectively if you don't manage the skills of communication? So with these skills online, staff can actually be properly equipped and be able to give their best as far as the work is concerned. Even from the job man source, they get to learn about team management. How do they get to work collectively with their team? How do they cohabit with people that they are working with? They also learn leadership skills. Because for every project manager, you have to learn some set of skills to ensure the project is properly executed. So with this kind of learnings for your staff put in place, you see that they are growing in the job and that same learning that they are doing personally actually transcend to their day-to-day -day activities. The other thing we can actually do to help in their personal training and development session is implementing the staff development session, that's the SDS session, whereby a particular day of the week or even an hour can be set aside for staff to actually come about, okay, every staff have, have to get a particular book that they read or even a course online. For instance, my company, what IMG did for us this year was it went online to get some courses for us from Udemy. So it got different HR courses for everybody in the office. And everybody has three courses for each month. So after which you are done with your course, you have to train everybody, you have to teach everybody on that particular course you have read. So it wasn't easy actually, but we have to do it because. Whether you are busy, everybody's busy actually. Everybody's busy because we all know HR work is not an, an easy work. But with that, that, that mindset, I actually felt this is actually impressive because in your, in, your, in your quiet time, you can actually go online to do the course. So everybody did the training course on Udemy, and a time was given to us every day of the week, I think from 4 p.m. to 5. So everybody has to log in to this particular link. Once it's four, you know it's time for SDS. It is time for SDS. So with that, in, with that in your mind, you get to know that you are the one presenting next week. You will have prepared your slides, prepared for your course and everything. And you have to teach everybody in the team what you have learned as far as the course is concerned. So with that, I, I believe HR and managers can actually boost the morale of their staff working and you get to see that they are developing on the day-to-day -day activity. And that's actually take a tone on the work they are doing because definitely you get to see more results. They are more they are giving their whole as far as the work is concerned. So that's actually talking about the training and development for our staff. Now moving to onboarding sessions. For every new employer employee we have joining the team, we need to ensure they are properly taken through the company's onboarding session. 
which actually gives them the room to understand, get themselves acquainted with the do's and do's of the organization, the policy that guides the organization, the mission statement and vision statement, because where there's no law, there's no offense. So that I start will not come up today. I don't know what this means. I don't know what the company is up to in the next two, three, five years. So with the onboarding session, they get to be properly integrated into the team and they get to be part of the team. They know what the company entails and where the company is going to, and they get to work in alignment with that goals and objectives set by the company. So onboarding session is actually critical as far as employee engagement is concerned. Also, we have some high performing staff or even low performing staff among us in the team. So as, as, a, as a company, as managers and HR, we need to celebrate and recognize the success of our team members. No matter how small it is, whether someone just got a certification or got promoted in, in his or her role, we should celebrate them. Let, it, let, let make them feel valued. Let, it, let them feel valued because that actually gives them sense of value and help them to do more. And that in turn gives the other people that are not performing well to help their game. So for people that achieve a particular feat, they should be celebrated. They, they should feel that, okay, the company appreciates your efforts or recognize your success. So that's actually one of the important parts of this employee engagement as it concerns HR and managers. So I, I also need to let us know, because I believe many of us on this call are not oblivious of the fact that we all know the huge impact this recent subsidy removal by the federal government has had on every employee. And this is not the time for HR and managers to take the bus seats and be, be for that hand acting on concern. This is a time for us to just plan something for our staff, maybe implementing the COLA system. That's talking about the cost of living allowance. And maybe just a one-off payment, certain amounts of money is put at the one-off payments or transport allowance for our staff. This, no matter how, how small, how big the money is, they actually go a long way, making them feel, wow, this is a nice initiative by the, by the management team. Make them feel valued and let them know that their concern is actually taken into consideration. I believe that such an employee will come to work the next day happy. I want to do more. I even want to stay more in the company. So these are the things most of, most of the time we don't pay attention to, but they are critical thing that actually keeps employee working and working well. There's a difference between working. Let me just go and work because I need salary. But when you are working with an employee, working effectively, you want to go the extra mile. So these are the things that boost employees' morale as far as employee engagement is concerned. So also in, in this book, I got to learn that most of the time, we as HR and managers, we don't like passing ways with our staff, especially the high flyers. Um, and I believe everybody on this call, we all know the, the trending jackpot syndrome in Nigeria. Every staff wants to jackpot either to another country or to another company, so to say. So nobody wants to leave their best staff. Nobody wants to leave their top performing staff to go like that. But as it is, I can assure you, there's little or nothing you can do about it. To get to a stage, an employee just decide this is the time for me to move. And I believe we should respect their opinion. So with that, this is not the time for us as HR and managers to disrupt the, the long time harmonious relationship between us and that staff. We should respect his or our opinion. And with that, we can actually have an exit interview for such an employee we get, where we get to know, oh, why do you want to leave? Is there any problem? Get to hear their feedback and even their plan going forward. And we can also plan a wonderful exit celebration for them. Make them feel that they will be greatly missed by the team. I believe an employee that leaves the company on a good note, whenever he or she, he or she sees a huge opportunity or a big project, such an employee will never hesitate to recommend the company. Such an employee will never hesitate. That is why we need to pay attention to this key thing. We should not burn bridges. Don't burn bridges. An employee that left your company today can recommend you to like two, three more bigger projects tomorrow. 
they will have to be cognizant of this world. So as managers and HR also, we need to create an enabling work environment. I don't think there's any staff that can thrive in a work, in a toxic workplace. We should endeavor to, to strike a balance for our staff, create a healthy work-life balance for them. It shouldn't be all about work, 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 work. Everybody knows the reason why they are coming to work, the office is about work. But don't get them born out of work. Place a balance. You can actually make time out, maybe a particular day of the week where we plan a movie day, game day, or sport day, where people just after work an hour or two where they get to assemble in a particular session of the of the of, of the company, maybe a training room where they you can play music, watch movie. People get relaxed with that. They, they, they feel refreshed and rejuvenated. But at times, employees, when, when, when you are working, you might just get too tired and you may not want to complain, actually, because so that you not be like, why, why are you complaining so much? But when there's this balance with work and lifestyle, people get too happy. And I believe everybody on this call also, see, I know you are fully aware of that. That is why HR hangouts is put in place. Why do you think we have HR hangouts? For HR all over the country to come around, to mingle together, to relax. We go to beach, we went, we went to cinema, different kind of outings actually for us to relax our mind, to network and integrate ourselves with different people. So with this, we can actually implement this kind of thing in our companies. All work and no play, make Jack a dog boy. People have to get refreshed and happy with the work they are doing. As much as we have people that want to perform, that want to do the work, they also need to relax. At times, for people that are reading a lot, to get to a stage, maybe we are reading, reading, get to just have this kind of migraine on your head. At that point, you should just take the book, leave the book and relax, maybe listen to music or play games. So these are the things that actually matter, but most of the time we don't pay attention to. So the other thing we can do as as is in the work-life balance for employees, maybe we can create a picnic. We take a particular day, maybe weekend, outside the company, where we, you, you, you tell your staff to come around. You can even tell them to come with maybe one or two of their family members, where we get to just relax, play music. We can go to a more a lounge where we, everybody gets to meet and do things, or even travel out of it, or even you can you plan a retreat, travel outside the states, go and have fun. With these employee few that they, they are concerned, like they are duly valued. The company is, all, is not thinking about their work alone, but also their lifestyle. Their lifestyle. So with this, I believe everybody wants to be in that kind of company more. For a company that is not just particular about you have to do the work, do the work, no break time, no free time to do anything. Such an employee will get so tired and we will be looking for the next exit door. So we have to pay due attention to this. So talking about performance, I believe no employee can perform on the same level. Though we can we can have some sort of similarity, but we definitely have some top performer, performing staff and some that are not performing as expected as far as their KPI and JD is concerned. So with this, you can actually help our staff to up their game, improve their performance. That's a, where performance appraiser comes in. Where you get to have a session with them, ask them how the work is, is there any challenge, as far as the work is concerned, is there anything they need help about? Is there any way you can assist them? Is there any challenge they are going through as far as the work is concerned? So with this, you get to know their feedback. You get to know where the challenge is. For those that are not performing, you get to let them know where they are lagging behind. And for the high performing staff during the appraisal session, that is where you get to tell them that their performance is actually noted and appreciated. And all, there is always room to do more. Encourage them to do more. Give them terms of a word of encouragement. And for the low performing staff that are not performing to the to expedition, encourage them to help their game. Give them the support they need, the confidence they need, the moral support they need, as far as being the manager is concerned. 
you can even if, if, at the worst case scenario, you can actually put such an employer on a performance improvement plan where you put him or her on it, okay, maybe a month or two. Okay, let's watch how this goes. Let me know how everything is. And you get to monitor such an employee. I believe this kind of employee will know that, oh, my manager is actually in support of how I feel about this work. And such an employee want, you never wants to disappoint you. you. Definitely wants to improve his or her performance. So performance appraisal is very, very critical as far as employee engagement is concerned. So talking about the new bees now, for the new staff that are joining us, they are new, they have gone through the onboarding session and everything. We shouldn't just say, okay, because they are new, we should just leave them. They can also be sad with some sorts of responsibilities. Give them some tasks, some projects to handle. Let them do these things. Okay, can I even give them a time timeline? Okay, hello, Shola, you just joined the team. Congratulations. Okay, after a month or two, handle this project. Thus, I believe such a staff, after completing such a project, we have this sense of accomplishment and give them proper integration to the team. You should not micromanage staff. Don't micromanage staff. Let them take charge. Let them take ownership for whatsoever project they're handling. So I believe with that, you are building a leader in them. And at the same time, they get to do more work. They get to and do a lot of things that you, even when you are not there, you, you, you have that kind of feeling that oh, I believe Shola can do it. This is actually how we build leaders. So employee engagement is actually very, very important and something we shouldn't take lightly. So in rounding off now, employees who are connected to the organization are typically more motivated, dedicated, and productive, and even stay longer. But if I'm working in a company where I feel I feel I feel at home, I don't have a boss that is toxic. I don't have a manager that is always focusing on my, my activity. But my the manager that wants my growth, that is so particular about my well-being, that is so particular about my feeling, how I go about my daily duties. I want to stay more in that company. So they feel motivated, dedicated. I even want to stay more longer in the company. And this actually transcend to their performance, how they perform on the day-to-day -day activities. They want to go the extra mile and also even the way they relate to their colleagues. So it's actually very important for us to pay attention to these few things, few things that we learned from this book. As for me, I've learned a lot from the book and it's something I really appreciate. So employee engagement is very, very important and we need to take due consideration to this as we get to our work and manage our staff duly. So because I believe staff that are part of the team, they feel they are part of the team, they can even give their feedback to the management because they know the management is open to to opinions. They can give feedback. They okay, say, I think we can do this thing like this. But I think we can make plans to achieve this thing like this. They feel okay, they are part of the team. So everybody has to give that concerted effort in achieving that organizational lay down goals and objectives. So that's actually what people talk about. Thank you, Ellen. Amazing. Thank you so much, Shago. Ah, you just you took us, you know, took us to different areas of the book. I really like, I particularly liked the part about relating it to what is going on right now, um, where you talked about, you know, getting employee engagement in these times that we find ourselves, you know, the subsidy thing, what are we doing? What are we thinking about to um, keep our employees engaged? And there are certain things that, you know, um, you, I mean, we've, we've, we're in HR uh, platforms, we see recommendations. You talked about introducing, even if you can't, necessarily increase people's salaries you can introduce the CEO, uh, cost of living allow, uh, adjustment the cola little little things here and there um introduce hybrid working these things create you know engagement you know people will feel valued that oh the company is actually thinking about me and sometimes it's just the little things so thank you so much Shegu. thanks 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 okay so I, I mean i'll before i go back go to my own session uh or my own part and let me just touch on certain things that stood out to me you know in the areas that Shegu talked about 
So like, you know, when we talk about employee uh, growth, right? Um, a, an, uh, an employee that feels that the company is invested in their growth will be engaged. You know, if I feel if I'm in a company and I feel that the company is interested in my development, I definitely will be engaged. And there were some recommendations here. Um, some of the things that look like mentorship, you you have um, new hires that come in or even hires that are like mid-level or whatever. You have the company introducing things like coaching for the mid to uh, top level uh, empl employees. You have things like leadership development. Yeah, I remember, you know, um, place I worked so the mid mid level people they were preparing them for for leadership so what it was was we went through a series of trainings yeah to prepare us for those kind of things um things like job rotation when I know that you know the company is invested in me so we had people that you know they were when we do talent reviews we would look at them and you know in terms of succession planning we, we were planning we had career paths for them or clearly defined career paths for them we would rotate them we we'll take them around the world. So maybe they're going to be um, country manager here, you know, and when you know that that's the plan the company has for you, uh -uh, you'll be engaged now because they're like, these people, you know, they have me in mind. And there, there's something that I saw that resonated with me, lunch and learn sessions. You know that sometimes people are in companies and they don't know what goes on in the other, you know, even some people are just restricted to their own department. They don't know what goes on in other departments. I remember another place I worked where, you know, we would have sessions where other teams would come and do lunch and learn sessions for us. So legal will come, um, engineering will come, the different arms of engineering will come, we would have lunch and then would learn. And it was just exciting. We looked forward to those uh, kind of things. And then your, so things like your office environment, how, do, how is your office environment? How have you crafted or designed your office environment to engage your people? There are some offices I go into and I, I'm depressed and I'm like, I, not that well depressed is too much but I walk in there and I'm like how do these people work you know you know that it is design of it of your office can even you know add or you know enhance your engagement you come to work and the environment is great ergonomics you know the chairs are right you know the environment is right nobody's saying that you have to be a Facebook or the Silicon Valley kind of people where they have snooker board here if you can do that fine but then you have to know what works for you. But what's your aim? What, how, how are you designing your environment, your work environment for your people? Is it safe? Do your people know that you're taking safety into consideration for them? Or it's just, well, people should put your seat. Everybody, you know, face each other. You don't really, it, I mean, that would show that you don't really care about your people. And then how would people feel engaged in that kind of work environment? So that those things are important. And then you know that it categorizes different kinds of employees. So you have people like the remote employees, you have the gig employees. So the remote employees, we're working from home. We are not the stepchildren. So remember them, don't forget them, right? Make sure that, you know, because they require unique attention. They, you know, you have to do things to um, carry them along. Make sure that they're still part of the system. So have, um, outings or you know events where everybody gets to meet each other so it's not like I'm just behind the screen all the time I get to meet even those people that work on sites you know so what are you doing for those kind of people also you know make sure that they're not overworked because for some of us that work from home it's so easy to get caught into the web of overworking so what are the things you're doing yes <laughs> what are the things you're doing to make sure that you know they, they are not overworked yeah um you know, and just make sure that they're not kept in the dark. I remember that, you know, there are places I would, I work, or there's a place I worked that, you know, we had um, contract staff, you know, they will come and say, ah, we, cause we are, we are offshore. We don't get to hear these things. And, you know, so we tried, uh, we, we had to start looking for ways to keep them, you know, in the know of certain things. So these are like the contract kind of staff, you know, make sure that you include them in all comms, whatever communication you're putting out there. Remember that those ones are there or they are part of you. They are still part of your staff and they need to be, part, you know, they need to be involved in whatever that is going on. Whatever team bonding activities you have, make sure that it cuts across or it, it also touches them or they are part of it. Now, um, Shego talks, spoke to the new employees, you know, what, you know how it's like you join a company and you just feel like you're so lost in a whole big company. Nobody, you don't know what to do, where to go. You know, some, some people recommend giving the person a body so that the person that person has been in the system, 
right? You, 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 you have that person guide the person, you know, the person knows his way around and says, okay, this is what you need to do. This is what you, you, you need to do. And maybe you even give them goals, you know, when they start, you know, because when I come, if I come into a place and I don't know what's the plan for the company, nobody has told me anything. I don't have a JD, you know, make sure that you're ready for that person. It go, it's as little as even having the person's work desk ready with their laptop and everything. Sometimes some people resume work and they don't even have their laptop and they're just sitting down for like days before they remember that, oh, IT is supposed to send a message. Oh, we're supposed to be sending a message to IT. So make sure that, you know, you are prepared for that new employee, right? Um, and then even um, for, for, for people that are bringing, somebody, we're talking about um, engaging people from onboarding. I think I suggest that you even engage people from the point of shortlisting. The point that you already start talking to someone, give that person the employee experience. You know, let the person feel like, you know, there are some people that go through interviews with certain companies and they're like, even if they don't uh, get the job, they're like, wow, what an experience. That's the place I would love to work because see the way I was treated from the point that I, you know, I was contacted to the point that I was, you know, sometimes you go to places for interviews and you're sitting down for, for hours and hours and, you know, the front desk person is like rude and everything. And I'm like, I really want to work for this kind of company. So the engagement starts from that point, yeah? You give that person the great candidate experience, then the person comes in, you give the person a great employee experience, and the person is like hungry and thirsting after, oh, what's next? You know, what, what is next? Um, then when uh, uh, Shego talked about exiting employees, what came to my mind was building an, alum, uh, 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 an alumni group, right? I remember somewhere I've worked. I, I left that place years ago. But we're still, I'm still in touch with a lot of people from that place because we're connected, you know. We were also connected that, you know, we still, you know, we're still, so even if the company, even when the company has projects, they reach out to us and say, hey, recommend people. So even if we're not in the space, we don't, maybe we don't want to go back to work there, but we can recommend. So it's not just recommending the company for jobs, but even recommending people to come, you know, to work in that place. So People there would reach out to us and say, hey, we need a hire. We need to hire people and you need to hire people for this roles or for this project. And we're happy to do that because we're a close knit family. So you find that wherever, and I'm talking about globally, wherever we are in, in the world, once you know that this person worked here, you can just call the person's name and, you know, there's everybody gathers, you know, you're happy to help that person because we all worked together. So you find that there are events, everybody is still there. There's still this connection. And I mean, that could not have come if we were not engaged in the company. And I remember that there were so many things that the company did to keep us engaged. We may not have been earning the best of salaries, but you see that thing about engagement. Oh my God. They, I think, you know, now that I think about it, there was so much, or there was quite a bit that was done about that. Now, going to this part of my, um, my, my, my side of the review of the book, change management. So when the company is undergoing a change, you have to make sure to keep the people engaged. I remember in the time of the pandemic, nobody had ever experienced the pandemic before. So my company then were like, you know, dealing with stuff. We had to do salary. Um, we had to do salary cutting, you know. But how did we, how do we keep the people, their morale high? There was a lot of engagement. There was a lot of uh, communication. You know, we kept people in the know. We're transparent. You know, we provided platforms for people to talk. We was pandemic where there was a lot of room, remote working. In fact, all of us were working from home. We're forced to work from home. There were, so there was a lot of fatigue because you were, we were bombarded with COVID, COVID, COVID. There was information overload. People were just going crazy. But you know what? We just kept on doing things to keep people, you know, um, updated. We're giving them information. We're training people. We're providing therapy for people, doing all kinds of things just to keep them you know, um, engage and keeping their morale up, you know. So those are the, those are, that was change management going on. We had to be on top of our game. We had to make sure, okay, we're introducing policies. Okay, we had to bring about remote working. We're updating and doing all those things up and down, you know. So make sure that you communicate with your people during the time of change management so that you keep them engaged. Or else if you are going through a change and you don't keep them, you don't communicate with them, People start disconnecting. They start disconnecting. Before you know it, once they disconnect from the, with their mind, before you know it, they're out. Now, for that balanced employee experience, you can provide flexible work hours. Like now, we talked about what is going on now. Provide hybrid work hours. You can, you can, um, like what some companies are doing. You know, um, you know, some days in the office, some days out. I remember this place I talked about where I used to work. 
one of the things that kept people you know, made people not leave our work hours were amazing like we were the one of the very few in Lagos that were closing pretty early there was a time we used to close at three um no sorry we used to close at 3 30 then when the, the time the bridge was um shut down and then we revised it to in fact we revised it to 2 30 then we went back to three o'clock then at some point our clients were like mm, you guys are closing too early they now made it four but you know for those times i mean when i would think of leaving i'm like which place will i go that you know because i would i would close from work and i get home and it's daytime and i can you know be at home spend spend time with my children and so for me that was the thing that kept me engaged and we had a lot of family people in the in the organization so that worked for them so you you have to think about what it is or how your organization is the demographics you know what will cater, what are the things that will keep them engaged and put those things in to cater to them um, and then there was something I said, and it resonated with me. Don't reward star performance with overwork. I used to work in the bank. That was my early career. And the department I was in, we were the top performers. You know what they gave us as, as reward? So we had targets. Our target, our target was running in hundreds of millions. So we were just knocking the pack over. So they tripled our, the, you know, when we hit our goal, they tripled our target. So it was like, ah, we would now be like, okay, so why are we working so hard to reach this target? Yes, we were, the bonuses were coming, but it was like for the more for the work you do, you just you know it's like the thing is ramped up so much. Like, ah, when does it end? So don't reward your your star performance with too much work because it fatigues them, and at a point they'll be like, how much further can I go? Yeah. So focus on what energizes them. Yeah. Don't uh, don't fatigue your people. There's something that some companies do before the holiday is over. I've seen banks do it. They'll say they're closing half day. That those little things as little as that get people excited that I'm going to close half day or Friday, I'm going to close. I know, I think it's um, British Council or so. Those days, I remember, I don't know if they still do it. On Fridays, they're half day. A couple of companies do that too. And so that you know, makes them feel excited. Some companies, they do things like, I know Shegu talked about, uh, well, he said game day, we're talking about events. Some companies provide gym membership to their uh, uh, member, uh, to their um, uh, staff. So you're coming to work, before you get to work, you go to the gym, do stuff on your way. So those, those are little, little, little things that, you know, you're like, hmm, okay. Then moving on to feedback. Me, I like feedback. I, I thrive on feedback. So any company I get into, I have conversation with my boss and I say, this is how me, this is what I like, or this is how I like to work. And I, I, find, I found myself to be with bosses that like that too. So um, you should create an, an, an environment for feedback to thrive, right? So you have uh, managers that are happy to give feedback and happy to receive feedback. So the relationships I've had with some of my bosses is that, you know, they're happy. They will, they'll sit down and listen to me because me, I'll give it to you clear and plain. Uh, you know, and they were they were always was willing to listen to that feedback. You know, isn't it? Just tell me, hit me with how it is, and I would tell them, and it helped them because they would they had blind spots, and because you know you know as a manager there's a certain way you see things, but they were happy to take that feedback, and as well they were giving me that feedback. So you know, if you have an environment where people are you know there's feedback going back and forth, people are engaged because they know where they stand. They are not in the dark. They don't have the surprise. Remember we talked about performance appraisal where. You're waiting to the end of the year. You know, somebody has been performing great, 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 great. Then when it gets to like November, he just does something. Then when you do performance appraisal, you say, you, you did not meet expectations. It, of course, the person will be angry because like, ah, you know, what did I do? I mean, I've been performing all through the year. But if there's been that consistent feedback, right? Monthly, you're giving the, that feedback. Oh, I think, you know, this is your KPI. You know, you're 20% you're there. You need to amp it up. The person is aware, so there are no surprises. So have that environment where there's a culture of feedback. Now, make sure that you're creating this culture of engagement. Um, um, you know, um, encourage regular activities. Shagu talked about it. Companies do things like TGIF. You know, you're looking forward. So it's not all work and no play. Make sure that, you know, you have that play inside you know have your tgifs you know where people that come to feel feel good and feel free let the walls not be too uh, high up there you know people say eh, i come to work this person cannot be my friend they are they are my colleagues they're not my friends okay good for you my best friend was my colleague we worked together for almost 10 years or more and that's my best friend in the whole wide world and that i met her at work 
So you just never know where you might meet that person, you know. So if you have those high walls where everybody's just, their noses are up, you know, um, that environment, encourage friendships. At, and I met her in this place that I talked about, that there was a lot of engagement. And there's been a lot of deep relationships that came out from that organization that, <laughs> excuse me, till now, some of us are, I said, if I travel and I go to, if I go to Canada, if I go to UK, there's someone that works there. If they know that I'm there, ah, I'm, I'm good, you know. So create that environment for those kind of things. Create traditions. What are the traditions that are peculiar to your own organization? You know, my own organization, we had things like TGIF. We had, um, we had you know, things. Our boss would just come and declare pizza day. I would declare muffin day. Um, I just come and be like, hey, guys, I'm just in the mood for muffins. Muffins for everybody. Well, not for the whole organization, but for my team. So, you know, there was that culture, like, you know, ah, we know that something is going to happen today. Even the birthdays, you know, we talked about it in the group. What I, how do you do your birthdays? In some places, in, in the last, in, in, in places I've worked, sometimes, you know, the money is given for your birthday. So there's a set amount given. So you get your cake. The, the department is responsible for getting a cake for you. So whatever else you add, you add that's on your pocket. But then we're all looking forward to someone's birthday. We're going to come and sing and dance and have fun, eat cake, eat something. And then, so what are the traditions that you're creating? Because those are the traditions that help to cement employer engagement. This place that I worked, we used to have end of year party, right? And that end of year party, you, would, you can invite your family. So your family will come if you want your friends. And then every department had to do a performance. And I remember HR that they used to look at, ah, we're very officious. We're always doing all these things up and down. That then we would perform. So this year we would dance. Maybe we're doing Indian dance. The other year we're doing ballet. I'm talking HR. So you see all these guys that were, we made sure that from the top to the bottom, everybody participated. And so, so everybody would let themselves down. You would see managers, you know, like, hey, you know, having fun. And that was a tradition that we looked forward to. And honestly, that kept people engaged. People were always look excited, you know, happy to, I'm not saying that people were not happy at some point in time, but there was this thing that just kept us, you know, kept people, you know, um, cemented relationships, cemented people's ties or bonds to the, to the company. So what are the traditions that you're, you're keeping in your, in your company or you're forming in your company? And then, Communication. I've talked about this thing. Communicate. You cannot, I don't think you can communicate, you can over communicate. Make sure that people know, people know what is going on. Don't keep things in the dark. Um, I've worked in a place where look, we're getting emails, we're getting comms, we're getting, you know, where we have town hall meetings. The, the CEO is talking to us. So you cannot say that whatever is going on in the company, you're not aware. It's not true because there must be a way that that information will come to you. You know, there's so much communication. Talk with your employees. You know, as HR, I, I used to say, it, HR is not the one in the ivory office. You need to come down and come down with other people. Just, you know, find out, oh, hey, hi, what's up? You know, talk to them on a personal level. Get to know people on a personal level, not just on the work um, level. And then have, I, I recommend and I tell people, try to have regular town hall meetings. And not town hall meetings where you're, as the MD or as the managers, you're going to talk at the people. Have, let there be a platform for people to also speak, you know. Uh, give feedback and all that because you know that's where the communication people don't you don't want a place that oh it's only the, they only hear from the ceo they only hear from the MT, and nobody has a platform to speak their own minds no people should be happy to speak their minds reward 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 like i said sometimes i feel like oh you guys have done a fantastic job muffins for you sometimes our boss will come into the office and say okay guys i'm getting coffee for all of you i'm getting smoothies for you and you know that gingers us for the day, like, hey, you know, oh, you guys did well. You know, I remember this place I worked, it was project-based. So when we accomplished, when people completed the projects, they would go out for lunch, you know. So people were excited. They were excited to, you know, finish up the project. They will be celebrated, you know, they will be given recognition, you know, people are happy. Recognize people's families. Like you have, bring your children to school, uh, bring your children to work day, um, children's day some companies when there's children's day they'll they'll have the children come to the office you know you know you know think go, it's not not just about your people go beyond the people but you know their families when they have uh newborn babies what do you do do you give them you know uh hampers do you give them tokens what do you do show them that you care for them beyond not just them but beyond them you know all the way to their family and you know have organized lunches with the uh, CEO, CEO can sit down and have lunch with the, the people. Um, 
and you know have the CEO even do personal mails or handwritten notes to people in recognition. I know how good people feel. I remember when, you know, I would be in management meetings and, and you know, a HOD is mentioning someone's name in particular and saying this person. So it's not about, because when we have these management meetings, the HOD that we know and all that, but the HOD is mentioning that I want to give like a special recognition to Patrick because Patrick did this and the MD is hearing, the CEO, the country manager is hearing this. And of course, so when we put out like newsletters or comms, the people are, Recognize, ah, you'll be going about it, say hi, shoulder. You, you'll be happy. You know, it, it, it will keep that person engaged, and the person will want to do more. You know, so um, yeah. So you know, those are the things. Those are the little little things that we can do to um drive engagement. It, it, it sometimes it's just in the little things, like I said. How much? Sometimes it's just oh, okay, guys. I'm declaring cupcakes for people. I'm declaring muffins. Just make people feel. You know, have them have a laugh. You know. I remember this, I, I had this training with this organization and, you know, we went, you know, the training was outside. It wasn't in their office. And so, you know, we did some exercises. People were laughing and just with each other. They came out and they were like, ah, that they were so happy. They were like, this is the first time they've done something outside their office. And, the, you know, the, they, they, they had an opportunity to even meet other people that they work with, but they've never seen before they've never met with one-on-one -on -one. and then the fact that they were doing activities that were making them like they were playing you know everybody was like feeling like a child you know you could see them and it gave them renewed zest to go back to work so when we spoke with them weeks later they were like this thing impacted us so much people are happy to do their work they've had conversations they've had meetings and they talked about oh you know how can they work better because they've seen you know, they've seen the they've seen what that engagement in that in those that training did to them. So they're you know it's giving them a renewed vigor to go back to work. So when we talk about things like retreats and all that, you know, have things. Everything does not have to happen in the office. Sometimes you can you know organize things to go out of the office. Like Shegu gave an example: go for picnics, go for movie dates. You know, you know. Sometimes my boss will say, "Ah, guys, is anybody up for?" Is anybody around? Let's go out and watch a movie. And you're like, ah, this, some people are like, ah, this is my yoga. But because we have that culture already, it's not strange to us, you know, and then you come back to work and you're happy to work again. So really it's, you know, there's a myriad of things that you can pick from. I mean, there are 200 ideas and I'm sure that, you know, people can pick from them or you can, you can take one and adapt it, right? And I, I said it, I said, at the end of the day, you take your pick and now adapt it to your culture because, what works for A is not going to work for B. Uh, and so it is what you now you now take from this and now adapt that would now help drive your employee engagement. And I know this was a recurrent thing that was said in the group chat, you know, understand your business, understand what works, understand your people, understand the demographics of your people and understand what works for you. Then you can now apply the engagement, employee engagement ideas, you know, to your own organization. And then we we'll see what comes out of that. And so to, with that, it's come to, I come to the end of our review. Um, I don't know if people have any questions, uh, contributions. I think, I mean, we've gone over the one hour mark, but Yemi, I'm sure we have a little time for that. Yes, thank <laughs> you so much. Excellent presentation by Azine and Oluwa Shegu. Perhaps you're on this call, you read the book, you like to say something, or you like to share ideas, please quickly indicate by raising your hand so that we can go. Anyone, anyone, you read the book or you have an interesting idea you like to share, you can also quickly in the next one to two minutes, drop your engagement sessions, your team bonding ideas in the chat, book, chat box so that people can learn and take a cue. Many thanks to everyone who has dropped one or two comments. I can see Ajayi and Yola saying they do aerobic sessions. Yes, really That's nice. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. If everyone can just drop one or two ideas quickly, that will be a good way to wrap up. So I can see Wofi. Wofi, my sister from, from Podakot. You can unmute now, Wofi. And then we go over to Antoni. Wofi, your hands are up. I'm All right. Good evening, um, the facilitators. Okay. Good, good evening, evening, Mr. Luyemi. Um, let me, let me specially thank um, the Izinle and Luwa Shegun for doing justice to the book. 
I know that I uh, had collected just almost at the tail end of the month. So I got the opportunity to um, read through some chapters. And then this review, what Ezinia and Lushigun has done is to help those of us that had joined late to have a thorough understanding of what the whole book is about. But I know that um, one of the things for me, my take home from one of the chapters is, it's nothing new, but then it was too, um, as a leader, we also role model whatever character, whatever it is, and then the part where the particular chapter I talked about um, setting the 60 and 90 days goal, so, like the performance with employee after one year. I recall that I read in a particular chapter where emphasis was career engagement with employee. For example, for personnel who were just recruited one year after the job, it's important that as HR professionals, right, HR managers, you get to have this employee engagement with them. Now, this is now tailored to career advancement, career engagement session with them. And the questions that should be posed should be about what goals have I achieved in the past one year? Because the employee is going to tell you that, and then you're going to be in the position to help position the person and then um, set the next one year goal. But overall, it's been an impactful um, um, session. Special thanks to Evin Lea and Oluwa Shegu and Mr. Oli and me for creating the platform. Thank you so much. Ezine, Oluwa Shegu, you want to respond quickly before we move to Anthony, and then we go to Madam Rita Babalola. Um, I think it was the comments. I don't know if there was a response, but thanks, thanks okay, for five for your comments. Sure. Yes, Anthony thank Michael, you. you have the floor, please. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate your efforts so far. However, um, I just entered the uh, 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 room, but uh, I'm a little bit, should I say, confused now in that I've not seen the book. I'm not on the know uh, of anything about the book. Uh, invited me actually told me about a few minutes ago so please uh, I and at least okay. know the background of our discussion we'll, we'll drop that in the chat box for you Madam Rita Babalala over to you Hello, ma'am. Okay, problem. good evening. Yes, you were trying to, I mean, I was finding difficulty of mute. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for having me on. Um, isn't it? You did a wonderful job. It was like reading the book all over again, even though I didn't finish the book. I just wanted to highlight some things from what we've read so far. Number one, on the issue of onboarding, I know that most organizations don't have what you call like a body. When people join into new organizations, we hardly have organization having that kind of a new person is coming into the organization, there's always the need to let them have one or two people that they can always interact with. We call them like workplace body. I remember my son, when he was changing school in year five, before school resumption, he had a body. And do you believe now for like, this is like a year, even though the boy is not in the school, they still engage themselves. They are so close. It, it developed, it fostered a kind of relationship with them. And I learned from that immediately. I, I mean, I, got encountered with that, I implemented it in my work list. So it's something that we need to think about. You know, when you introduce people, that first stage of where people feel like they've gotten into a new place, they can't interact with people, but they can, they want familiar face that they can always see, they can always go to, they always build relationship. Then number two, you know, isn't it mentioned something like, if it's like for me, it's run the kind of meal conversation where everything is not formalized. I, for my team, I used to give um, call cards. And honestly, when I give the call cards, I don't have the total amount, I just put into work roles. So really having conversation with them. And I got to know that for data, I just assume for my data, because I have a Wi-Fi too, I spend less than 5,000 Naira, apart from um, what do you call it, the 
unlimited body, I mean, unlimited bundle that I have at home. So it was kind of an un unraveling for me to see that the least person in my organization spend as much as 10,000 on data. And this person is who I give like maybe a 4,000 Naira per month for data, I mean, for telephone or what you call call card. So sometimes when we interact with people that we work with, we find out that most of these things that we take for granted, it is until you get to meet them. That is when you can get them fully engaged in other places. And then the third one, um, don't overwork star employees. I think depending on the organizational culture, like when she mentioned, but it's clearly what you know. Once you meet target, they increase it. If you meet it this year, next year, just, be no, just know that you're going to have like a times two or 1.5% of that is given. But then the mistake we made is we overwork and make the first thing feel so overwhelmed that at the end of the day, they burnt out and they feel disconnected with the organization. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so, so much. Any comments on that comment? Olu Ashegwan, isn't it? We'll take Abimbola Fisher as the final contribution for tonight. Thanks, Rita. Yes, thank you for your for your observations. I, I'd really speak on the body thing because I found that you know some companies place that I don't say burden. It's not a burden. Place that responsibility on HR. You know, but HR has so much to do. But it's it's, it's only uh, best or more effective if that is happening. You know, you get the body from within the person's department so that the person is able to, you know, someone who's been in the system who understands how things work, they work with them. So I think it's learnings for us as HR, right? And then we put those things as uh, recommendations to the company and, you know, implement them and see how they work. I mean, yeah. So I like, thank you. Thank you for your observations. Thanks for your comments. All right. Thank you so much. Abim Bala Fisher, you may please unmute. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to speak to the body system, especially as it surrounds onboarding. Um, one of the things that I found out that most organizations do around it is just selecting uh, maybe a random person. Um, the rule of thumb has always been for you to select an individual within the organization or some group of guys within the organization that you know that they are high performing staff. That, in a way, gives um, give some bit of pointers to whoever it is that um that is their body the person understand that okay this is how work is being carried out in this organization these are the ethos of this organization because they are more or less like uh, people that represent the core of what is going on within your business because those are the pointers as to the people leading the charge in their respective um functions and their respective roles it's always good for you to try to ensure that the people that you are assigned as being bodies are top performing uh, employees. The second part that I would like to mention is the stay interview bit, especially as it relates to engagement. If you have top performing employees, it's always good for you to most from time to time ask line managers what will make these guys to stay, what will make these guys to continue to deliver on the goals that their respective department commands, then you can create um, special perks or special allowances for them because you understand that uh, according to the Pareto principle, which is 80 20, these guys are the ones actually giving you the 80% maximum output, and you would not want to lose them to competition and all of that. So um, you are more or less like your stars that you want to do anything in keeping them. So you have to really find out what actually makes them beat. And what are those engagement strategies that would actually continue to keep them within your system? That is all from me. Thank you so much, Mr. Fisher. Any comments, feedback? Shago, let me let me let you speak to it. I can come in later with my own. Uh, what was his question? Sorry. Not a question. He he made a he made a comment. Okay, so let me let, let me let me let me speak to what I I hear um uh, Bimbala say. So he talked about the body and he talked about you know using not just picking random people but you know picking high performing people. And I think that that is really interesting. What's in my head is that hmm, okay, I mean yes, but then uh, in my head I'm thinking the high performing people would they not 
also feel like they're swamped you know it's already they have the pressure of you know work and all that but i mean it's a fantastic i i when i heard him say i was like mm, that's really interesting it's a fantastic idea and you know that person that you have been attached to as a body might likely influence the way you work you know and if someone is guiding you you know in a high performance uh level you will be you might be likely inclined to you know go in that same path so i like that i really like that and something i've also taken note of and then you also spoke to the state interviews you know um about um engaging especially the high performance so you know the engagement strategies that work for them i remember somewhere in the book that talked about asking people what they i mean this was a broader perspective asking people what engagement strategy uh, engagement tactics work for them and I've had this, I mean, I've worked somewhere where, you know, we're told I was asked to, you know, ask people. No, I was not asked. I, just, I, 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 I thought about it. I said, okay, let's, you know, when my boss was talking, we're talking about, okay, what are the things we can do to engage people, recognition and reward um, uh, methodologies or activities or whatever. And I said, let's ask the people, let's even throw it out and let me know what, let's know what works for them. You know, so if you can do that, you can, you know, put it out to people and then maybe, you know, put your, uh, design your engagement strategies around or engagement uh, activities around what the people like so you ind individualize them remember I talked about you know understanding your organization understanding your demographics but I think Bimbola narrowed it down to even like during the state interviews asking the top performers because you want to hold on you want to reel them in you want to keep them stayed with you because hey these people are hot cake you know they're, there's competitors waiting to poach them so you also want to, I know you know what you went through to keep, to get them. So you also want to keep them reeled in, you know, so you think about what are the things that can keep them engaged. So fantastic um, comments from Bimbola. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Jumoke from the chat box says here, HR doesn't have to do everything. Involving employees is part of the engagement. For example, let employees plan the end of year party. You can also let the employees be in charge of office renovation projects and so on and so forth. Uluwa Shegon Mogwe, in 90 seconds or less, your closing remarks. Okay, so based on the comments Mr. Yemi just said now, I, I can't remember the name, that HR shouldn't be the one doing everything. We should make sure we involve our staff. So especially the new ones, I'll put for instance, the new staff of all that just joined the team nearly. Actually, she was made, she just joined the team, like I said. So my manager actually, actually made her the MOH, that's the Minister of Happiness. We have a Minister of Happiness in our, in our team where she has to plan for the, for the entire month. So every Friday, we have something planned out. Maybe we are watching a movie. We are doing gift exchange, we're having a picnic. So based on what she said now, this new staff was made a MOH. That's actually, like I said earlier during my, my presentation, you start with them responsibility, make them take some sort of task projects. With that, they get to feel integrated and part of the team. So now she's the one planning the picnic. She has to source for venues, she has to source for when we're in the office as I just today. She was blazing with the manager. Okay, are we doing small chores? Are we doing swallow? Are we doing rice? So with that, I got to know that okay, this kind of new employee, in the short while you get to see how she can manage a bigger project. So employee engagement is as little as it sounds. It's actually a critical aspect of the work where, as a manager, if you're able to engage your employee duly. If you're able to get them involved and part of the team, you can be rest assured that even without you being in the office, the work will go on fine. The work will go on fine. Like Z mentioned earlier, one thing that my manager does is so you can just come randomly and get pizza for everybody. Randomly. You are at work, you are, everybody's on the system. You are meant to close by five. At times, we don't leave the office at six because everybody just so engrossed with the work. A manager just come out of the blues and even got get she, the particular thing she my boss got for us. I don't know where he got it for maybe it was UK or anything. That taste, it the taste was something else. So as manager, as a child, you can go out of your way to just as little as this thing seems, they actually go a long way 
in making employees feel happy and engaged. I usually tell my my, my colleague something when anytime my boss does that. I just uh my one thing I like about all of this is the thoughtfulness. It's thoughtfulness for me. It may not be that big, but that shows your staff you put them in your mind and you actually care about them. So in closing, employee engagement is something we need to take cognizance of and with that, just to relax that. The more you engage your, your employee, the more you make them feel involved, the more you give them the, the reasoning that they are part of the team. Don't let, let them feel neglected. Don't let them feel they are, not, they are just staff. See them as your, your team member. Everybody will work collectively in achieving that common goal for the organization. And in the short why the organization will definitely thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Isn't it? I will suggest you bring Golushevo back. <laughs> no text. Like yes. So please, thank you for the next session. Your passing <laughs> remarks. I will type you Isine because we are <laughs> No, 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 I'm, I'm not going to go into too much, you know, because we're really spent for time. But I just re-emphasize that employee engagement is a very integral part of um, the organization, right? I mean, it, it has a very important impact or a heavy impact on the organization. And um, so, I mean, we have 200 examples. I'm sure that, you know, we can, all of us can, even if we just take one, we can relate to something. But at the end of the day, I emphasize again, Take what suits, understand your organization first. Take what suits your organization. I saw, you know, comments about, uh, you know, um, where people work or whatever, you know, the, the peculiarity of where you work. Yes, but I'm sure that if you take one, and the thing is, like someone said, I think Jumoke said it, it does not have to be expensive. It does not have to be expensive. You saw the example, certain things don't even necessarily cost money. But at the end of the day, like Shegu said, it's the thoughts that counts. And the fact that an employee will see it and say that, oh, my boss actually cares about me. So he doesn't just see me as an expendable resource that comes into the office and does work, but they see me as a human being. You know, doing that thing is what, the, when the person sees that you value them, then they're willing to put in more. They're willing to put in their best, you know, to do their work To And of course that leads to increased productivity. And at the end of the day, that thing that MDs, the management wants to see, increased productivity, of course, essentially leads to higher revenue, profit and all that. So yeah, let's take, even if it's one thing, you know, and then implement it and tweak it to suit our own culture, our own organizations. And then we'll see how that goes because it's a very, very important part, you know, of the organization. Thank you so much to everybody um, that was in on this uh, um, review session. It's been an amazing book. I, I love this. I love the fact that it's very colorful. You know, you can, you have very nice real life examples. Everybody can relate to it. And I look forward to our next book review. Thank you, Yemi, and thank you, Shegu. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Shegu, and on behalf of the over 100 people that joined this session at one point or the other, and the countless number of people who will watch it on YouTube, would like to say thank you for your leadership. We were truly engaged. Good night. Please make sure you, you is not too late to find me. Down the road, someone will smile at you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everyone.